welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 177, featuring the second part of my interview with the Shadowgate designer, Mr. David Marsh. In this part of the interview, we focus in on uh, the history of Shadowgate, ICOM simulations, and then Dave talks about the lessons he learned from his failed uh, Sherlock Holmes consulting detective Kickstarter, and what he changed uh, to make his Shadowgate uh, project successfully funded. A lot of great material here if you are thinking about uh, your own Kickstarter project or if you just want to know more about the history of the adventure game. A lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Dave Marsh. Yeah, you are something of a, a port master, aren't you, Dave? It's looking, uh, apparently the original Shadowgate you did with Carl, uh, is it Roloffs? Roloffs. Uh, back in eight, 1987 for the Macintosh originally, right? So... Uh, I want to talk more about Shadowgate, but first I'm just wondering why of all uh, computers back then did you target the Macintosh? Well, I'd actually come on board right after Deja Vu had gone out, Deja Vu and Nightmare Comes True had uh, gone out for the Mac. And um, so the company at that time just basically wanted to target the next generation machine. We, they were actually making some games for the Apple II, so it seemed like the, the obvious choice. But the fact that it was being driven by a Mac, uh, I'm sorry, by a mouse, and it had a Windows-based system, which nobody was going to, you know, no one had taken advantage of that. So really, Deja Vu was the first point-and-click, um, you know, Windows-based uh, game out there. And so uh, I think that that's really, when I had talked with the original owner, Todd Zipnick, about that when I came on board, he really wanted to go ahead and create something that was unique that actually used that. You have to remember those early games. Um, you know, you had you remember Dark Castle and stuff. I mean, these oh, were sure. out there, but they weren't taking advantage of what the UI was. So over the years, we kept looking at platforms and saying, how can we take advantage of this platform? What can we do um, to uh, not just, you know, not just, you know, necessarily port it, but take advantage of its its abilities? So uh, I guess it was just a natural, um, you know, next step. From going from the Apple II, uh, to the uh, to the Mac. Let's talk a little bit about ICOM uh, simulations. Yeah. So, as reading on Wikipedia, apparently this company was founded in 1981. You mentioned Todd. Uh, Todd. Uh, I don't really. There's not, I wasn't able to find a lot of information about this. You know, about Todd. Or Very company. controversial. So, no. Yeah. You know, what, what was going on? I mean, what was this company like? Well, how did you get involved with them? Well, that's actually interesting. I mean. Um, I was uh, I was doing volunteer work at a church, and I met a, um, a a guy there. He started going to the church, and he was a programmer, and he was um, working on uh, on Deja Vu. And actually, I think at that time he was working on Uninvited, which was the haunt the haunted house hit. And uh, his name is Terry Schulenberg, a great programmer. I think he's done a lot of work with Apple since. And um, and I had actually had one of these, um, bought a, I don't even know what kind of machine it was, but bought some machine from some guy's basement that I was able to actually do art on. And I just moved one pixel at a time to make, I think I was making, I was a kid, I was making battle Star Galactica Viper ships or something with it. And, and so he had, uh, we'd become friends and he had showed me McPaint. And, uh, and, you know, of course, it took forever to put the floppies in back and forth between the system disk. And um, I immediately took to it and thought that, um, you know, that would be something I want to do. And so he had mentioned to me that uh, they were always looking for artists. And um, I, because I was a huge Dungeons & Dragons fan, I thought it would be great to make a fantasy game. And so the company lent me a Macintosh. So, I, so Carl would come over and we would sit in the bedroom of my parents' house and design it and and uh, make the artwork for it, and um, and eventually ICOM gave us a job. And so, uh, in those days, there were just you know there was you know maybe there were were ten people or so when there were between programmers and and we were the only artists and designers. And uh, it was great. You know, it was easy to publish a game. Uh, Mindscape was just down the road. I don't know if you remember them. Uh, they was pub publisher, and so um, they were willing to put the games out and pretty much anything you could put out that um, uh, that would go in. Uh, what, what were there some of the game stores back then? Um, Egghead Software. And we had you Electronics know, Boutique. Yeah, they would, huh? So we had one called Electronics Boutique. Yeah, exactly. And so you know we would you know we would be able to go ahead and get those games out there. And so it was um, it was a wonderful time. I mean, 
it was uh, just a lot of Nerf war, war fights and, and ping pong <laughs> and playing and working on games till two in the morning. And so, um, you know, it was great. You know, we had finished Uninvited and, um, you know, we went through a big, you know, set on, on Shadowgate and then we started developing other adventure titles, Deja Vu 2, which was really an underrated, great, fun game. I really, uh, I loved, I loved both of those games, Deja Vu and Deja Vu 2. And then we were working on Beyond Shadowgate, which was about four times as big. Um, it was actually pretty much already programmed when the company decided to um, concentrate more on FMV games and side scrollers. Because remember, the, the the Super Nintendo had come out about that time. So, um, and then we had worked on a number of other <laughs> adventure games. We had one um, called The Awakening, which was a 1900s vampire. I'm sorry, werewolf. London werewolf type game, uh, which is great, which we still have the design for. Um, and then we had actually worked on a game called Gossip, which was a gossip columnist in San Francisco. I, I, I don't remember where that came from. I think I've tried to forget about it completely. And a, another game called Helios, which was a end of the world meteor going to strike the earth and you had to find pieces to a missile, which was uh, itself destined for destruction. Um, but uh, you know, we had we had worked on a lot of those games, so it was a real it was a real blast of a time of, of working on games. And then Carl and I would just sit there and day and night, you know, between you know uh, games of um, of uh, Robotron, we would sit there and make um, make ports of of Shadowgate Deja Vu, Uninvited and Deja Vu Two, and so literally, it was just port games all day long and it didn't bother us because we just loved those adventure games so much we would just continue to do it so that actually went on all the way into my career you know back even when I started making massively multiplayer games I was working with Infinite Adventures who had the license at that time to make you know to port the games to to uh, Pocket PC and Palm of course those platforms never took off as game platforms but uh, I always enjoyed it so Icon was a was a blast uh, you know I guess until we got we got bought by Viacom but one thing that always stood out to me, you know, I played the I played Shadowgate and all these games on my Amiga computer. And I was always impressed by how much they looked like a computer game. You know, they're very computery, you know, with the windows and the icons and clicking and dragging. It was a, you know, I almost thought it was a way to learn how to use a, a computer almost playing these games. So I'm just wondering how much uh, I mean, what was the what was the talk behind the scenes about this this interface? Um, you know, again, I, I mean, I came in a little bit late into the into the story there when we were developing, you know, developing that interface and stuff. But the key was really that um, it was the company was really being driven by programmers. So you have uh, companies that maybe are like more other media companies like Pixar that's being driven by story or by that kind of that look and feel. Certainly driven by story, but far less by technology. Although of course they they developed some fantastic three D technology. But Icon was really driven by programmers. I mean, it was developed, and uh, some of the, the first people there, along with Todd, were programmers. And so they really wanted to go ahead and make something that was going to take advantage of, of a Windows-based machine. And so that's why you got that. Also, I mean, we, as, as artists, we always argued that the, um, the graphics are too small. And, uh, you know, we wanted to go ahead and have it be a more immersive um, experience, which is what we have in, the, in the, the new 25th anniversary of the game this year. But we, um, you know, we always got outvoted, you know, and usually it always came down to, well, we could just never fit it on a disc. Although, you know, we would argue and show things how compression, you know, like pixels would compress very easily and we could get away with it. But, um, you know, the game screen always ended up being like 160 pixels by 100 or something, you know, with all the other bits around it. So, um, you know, for us, it was, it was, you know, really, again, the programmers were kind of driving what that look and feel was. So it de definitely did have that, that computer type, you know, I guess, interface feel to it rather than some of the games that you saw especially coming out of, you know, uh, companies like Sierra and, and stuff that had, um, you know, or Ultima that had that full screen, more immersive experience. But it, you know, was still some windows in it. But our windows always felt like they were something that you would see right off the, you know, the desktop of, right. you know, the Mac. But um, again, they were so new and different that uh, that you know, I think people really, you know, enjoyed it. So, 
Yeah, the small graphics definitely made the pixel hunting part more <laughs> more challenging. I, the graph. I, think I still I could still visualize exactly where that little stone is in the cable <laughs> room. Well, it's been ported so many times. Uh, I most people I talk to about the game seem to be most familiar with the Nintendo version. Is that the most popular port? I think so. I mean, it's actually a really neat uh, story. Um, you know, we had a great relationship with Kemco during those days, which was the Japanese game company that came to us and said, uh, we saw your game, we would like to port it to the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System, which is upcoming. And, uh, and, you know, of course, then we were just faxing back and forth. And we would fax back and go, well, that's all, all well and fine, but we don't think you can do it. I mean, we just don't think that there's that you can make the interface work and stuff. It's all Windows-based and everything. But thanks so much. And uh, they would come back and say, no, 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 we we can do it, and we've got prototypes and everything. And then they showed us their prototype, and we were pretty much blown away. So, I mean, for that time, for that system, it was pretty amazing. So um, I think it, it uh, there are a lot of people, obviously the game, I mean, I could, you know, if you listed off every single platform, you know, the, the vast majority of them were, um, I think, you know, seven out of 11 of them were, you know, PC-based platforms. And then you had the NES and the Game Boy Color and then the, the two phone versions. But um, that particular game, for, you know, for some reason really resonated with people. I mean, it was really different than the side-scroller games that were out there at the time. And so it, it, it did really well. So when, when I get emails of, from people who love the game, it's um, it's really pretty much um, two two out of every three say I love the NES version and I love the music, and uh, and then I get those other people that say man I played that game to death in the Atari ST, or on the Commodore 64 or whatever and that was oh when I had the Macintosh version that was the first game I had ever played on the Mac and so that's that's really cool so we actually have a very interesting you know I guess fan base. Which I'm the num you know I'm the number one fan of it, um, which is those people that played it on one of those computer platforms, and the people that played it on the NES or the Game Boy Color. So Dave, what's your favorite version of the game? Um, well I you know and I and I don't want this to sound trite, but I really love the Macintosh version, uh, and the reason is because um, I had never done anything like that before, and. Um, and to make something look interesting and fun and cool with black and white pixels um, was just such a challenge. Maybe not as much of a challenge as the CGA version to make something look good in black, white, cyan, and magenta. I mean, nobody could look good there. Everybody looked like this. But um, as far as, you know, the, the just making something look good in black and white and then getting it to compress properly and get it on there, just from that standpoint, it was such a struggle, but just such a joy when it came out. So I think I like that version the best, although it was so limited in animation um, that it was, it was tough. And so, again, not to sound trite again, but the new version that we're in pre-production on is just... It's just everything that we kind of wanted to do with the game and uh, to take it to that next level and full screen and most immersive. So um, I guess it's it's the bookends. You know, I, I uh, there were you know there were some versions the the Commodore sixty four version that Carl did most of the art for that was just a nightmare that we didn't <laughs> get because it was really more vector graphics than anything and kind of sprites and it was really really rough, but. Um, and then, you know, the pocket PC and Palm versions were fine, um, but they were just so hard to see and to play, so. So the Commodore 64 version, you're going to go with that as your least favorite? My least favorite, only because it was really, it was really difficult to, to do the graphics and to get it to fit, and it was just, um, it was just a bit of a, of a nightmare. So every time we had to make a change to that, we kind of cried. Like um, which which was appropriate because it was tough. Well, what about the uh, the Kickstarter pledge amounts? Have you worked out you know how much your people will need to pledge in order to get a a, a digital copy? And are you going to have a box copy? Yeah, yeah. We, feelies and bonuses and all this kind of oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, the the things that we're offering. Um, you know, as far as this Kickstarter goes, we spent so much time not just working on the pre-production to let people see what our vision for the game is, but also on the rewards because we said, 
we, we vowed to each other we would never make anything for a reward that, um, that we wouldn't want ourselves. So there's going to be no coasters or shot glasses or that we just said, let's just slap a Shadowgate logo on. So um, we've got a box game, plus you have to have a cloth map. So we've got the box game, cloth map, and, um, and not just any box. It's going to be a really durable box that like you get from board games, something that you can display that you know, has some heft to it. Um, and then the poster, when you see the poster, you're just going to about wet your pants because it's, it's been done by our artist Chris Cold, who has a very painterly style. It's unbelievable. And, um, and so we've got that, you know, some of the traditional things. But then beyond that, Coleman Charlton, who has been a um, card and board game designer for 30 years. He, um, he did the Rollmaster playing system. He did the Middle Earth collectible card game. He works on Settlers of Catan, if you've played Catan. Um, he's in town here, and we've been friends for a long time. And I went to him, and I said, you know, I'm thinking about some rewards. And he said, let me do a Shadowgate card game. So a complete 54-card deck Shadowgate card game that... Um, replayable, fun, just, it's a blast. Uh, he's been designing it. We've actually already designed the cards. So we're gonna actually be able to show it in, in an update. Um, that's great, that's a great thing. And then I found a um, sculptor in North Carolina, which is the next state down from us, we're in Virginia. And he's actually sculpted an 18 inch Staff of Ages and a 72 inch Staff of Ages. And so he's, he's already done it. And so these are things like, we need a freaking staff on our deck, uh, on, our, on our desk. And, uh, and we need a 72 inch Staff of Ages. And you can actually see that in our promo video. So, um, so, you know, we've got the rewards that we're offering. Again, we're not, you know, we're not asking for the moon on this, on this game. And, um, and so we're being very smart about the rewards that we're offering, but also things that we think that people would really want and again, things that we would want ourselves. So, um, so again, you're not going to see any, any shot glasses, but um, you know, if you're up for like a Shadowgate card game, I mean, this is you know, you know, this is for you. What about a Shadowgate drinking horn? No, the Shadowgate drinking horn is. We actually, um, we actually talked about some other things that we want to do, and, and we're fans. I, you know, you and I were talking beforehand about T-shirts, and we're fans of T-shirts as well, and, and we want to go ahead and offer a couple of those because, um, well, we would wear them. Uh, but uh, there are some things like uh, the stabs are made out of um, resin, so they're just beautiful, and you'll see that. But uh, the other things is we actually um, had Kenny. Kenny Hudson is our sculptor. We actually had him make a torch, an 18-inch torch out of it that maybe could be a, a, something we still offer if, if uh, the campaign is really successful. But we said, you know, what's better than, you know, an iconic torch that you could stick on the wall, you know. And, um, but, uh, no, we didn't talk about the drinking horn, though that is, that is fun. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll keep that in mind. You know, I got another idea, too. How about a, a little keychain? Uh, flashlight that looks like a torch yeah no i mean there's some there's definitely some things that we thought about you know wanting to do that um that would be fun um but again you know the problem with with uh, and it's not it's a real balancing act between um you know trying to raise enough money to make the game and create um rewards that that people want but aren't so expensive that you can't you can't make the game and so you look at, and you know, you take into account shipping costs and everything under the sun. It's um, it's a real challenge to just you know make sure you know it's very tough to offer a physical item under a hundred dollars. Just shipping alone um, will break the bank. And so, um, you know, it took just a ridiculous number of hours just talking to distributors and manufacturers and everything to just try to understand what is the minimum quantity to to create an an item and. Uh, and then what is going to cost per item and then to ship it. Because if you think about it, if you offer a, a map um, and it, you know, it costs a certain amount to make, not only are you, um, do you have to make it and ship it for that pledge level, but every pledge level above it. And so that has to be taken into account. So the spreadsheet, the Excel spreadsheet is quite um, mind melting, I guess, when you look at it. So. Uh, but we love, you know, we, we, we believe that you have to give rewards, um, and uh, we know that people want physical rewards, and we're doing everything we can to make the kind of rewards that we think Shadowgate plans would love. 
Well, you are, this is not your first Kickstarter project. Right. Right, we have the Sherlock Holmes the Consulting Detective, which I'm sure I'm not the only one that's bitterly regretful about that. So uh, that Kickstarter project didn't quite make its right. uh, funding level. So what, what are you doing specifically that's uh, not going to allow that to happen with the, the Shadowgate? No, that's a great question. I mean, we I, I, um, I just have so, you know, I have no regrets about that campaign. That campaign was so much fun. And um, the goal there was to make enough money to to fund those particular games and um, uh, you know we've you know we've actually you know we were able to obtain some funding later to to finish the first three mysteries which I'm really glad about um, but that campaign there were a couple of things one is um, I didn't quite understand the pledge tiers enough and didn't um, you know going to something for the first time like anything else you know you learn so much from and um, offering nine mysteries at nine dollars you know was was uh, pretty much a killer right there. Um, the second thing is um, I didn't offer a box game. I didn't offer enough physical rewards. And so that's something that we, you know, I really underestimated the, the people that would really want boxes. Um, third thing is um, I was running the entire campaign by myself and trying to see how far I could get, you know, within the pre-production of the games. And um, for Shadowgate, you know, we have, you know, we're much better about the and those three areas much better about the um, the pledge levels and understanding that. Second, um, just offering more rewards that we think that people want. And then third, um, I have a campaign manager that is is handling all that, all the PR, all that, you know, all the things that come with that, with updates and everything. And then I guess also updates. I mean, we're planning a ton of updates. I mean, some of the things that you're going to you know see for updates are are really um, going to show people our passion for this game. So. Um, you know, right off the first update, I think is going up on day one, um, just because we want people to know that we're planning on doing that. And so, um, I think those things, and also the Sherlock Holmes games were were definitely um, a little bit more of a niche market. You know, uh, the people that played those FM games compared to, I'm sorry, the FMB games compared to Shadowgate, which I think has a larger market. Again, you know, you go into this and you don't know what to expect, but um, you know, I'm kind of one of those people that are undeterred. And so I, um, you know, I made some awesome relationships, um, you know, both with with fans, with uh, with the press, um, you know, with other people, and I, I kept in touch, and I was very communicative. So, um, but again, I'm undeterred. I mean, I, I think that we've got a great a great project here, and that um, one that that people would want, whether they're Shadowgate fans or not, it's a great adventure game. So those were the primary big, uh, you know, big things why I think it failed. And that I learned from, and then um, just you know come out swinging again. And it just came off uh, the Kickstarter for sort of Fargo with uh, Jeff McCord, and that one it was just I thought for sure that wasn't going to make because it was down to the wire, and he had like a thousand dollars left. And literally, like within the last half hour, yeah, you know, suddenly all these uh, donate uh, pledges came rushing in, uh, which is amazing. Yes, yeah, paints are very interesting in how they work. You know, you get somewhere um, where they're, you know, I just did one for uh, the, um, a, I, pla I backed, I don't know, a couple dozen or uh, projects between uh, my Zojo account, my personal account, and, um, you know, I just did one for a Catan uh, plastic uh, board because uh, I'm a huge Catan fan, and um, I love the guys at Mayfair that are here in town. And, and that got you know funded pretty much in the first day, and so there are some campaigns that that get funded uh, quickly, and others that take um, you know much longer. Uh, so it's you know it's hard to determine, and and uh, you know you can just do your best. I think the key is is um, you have to come out and and show them that you're serious. And um, if you ask for the moon and you don't show them something that can prove that you can make uh, a game worthy of asking for the moon, it's pretty tough. Um, if you ask for less and but show that you can make the kind of game that you're in the make, you know, hopefully you have more success. So, you know, it's it, you know, you watch the Obsidian guys and those guys have an unbelievable background. And I, you know, I pledged for that game too because I want that game. And um, and they did really well, but they also communicated very well, very well run campaign. And so, um, you know, it's um, it's tough. You just have to do your best. And I learned a lot from Sherlock, and I have no regrets. I mean, I I, I met some amazing people and. I'm just glad that I was able to get some of the games um, still done. And 
that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with another slice of this interview with Dave. Got a lot of great stuff coming up about his Sherlock Holmes and the, his other FMV games. So uh, great news for those fans of the CDI 3DO systems like that. A lot of great stuff coming up, so stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated and supported this show. It means a lot to me, guys. If you'd like to become a supporter of the show, just go to armchairarcade.com and click on the Match Hat link at the top of the page. And thank you very much for that. Now, what about that ale of the week? And I, I honestly think I could not have found a better ale uh, for the Shadowgate episode. Uh, this is uh, Outer Darkness, a Russian-style imperial stout. And as you can see, we've got the eyes here that look like a, a certain memorable scene from uh, Shadowgate. Uh, this is 10.5% alcohol, so definitely up there. It's uh, brewed in Utah by the Utah Brewers Cooperative. Um, Let's see if there's anything else here. It goes through multiple mashes to achieve its high gravity. 65 IBUs as black as night. I guess we'll see about that. And cold cellared like a Siberian winter. We hope you have as much fun drinking it as we did making it. Somehow I think that's a very distinctive possibility. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this outer darkness here in the old rather excellent drinking horn. It is uh, quite dark and very thick, and it feels pretty heavy. Uh, I think this is going to be a really uh, strong ale. I've been smelling it, and <sighs> you can almost smell, almost smell like I'm um, inhaling alcohol fumes here with this. Uh, there's quite a bit of a, a cherry, a blueberry, coffee. Uh, those kind of flavors. Actually, this one smells a lot sweeter uh, than some of the other stouts I've tried. Uh, it's not bad, though. It smells nice, except for the alcohol fumes. <laughs> anyway, let's give it a let's give it a taste here. Oh, <laughs> Ooh. Uh, yeah, this one is. Uh, uh, that one really hits you hard. Uh, this is definitely. Uh, I've tried. You know, beers with even more alcohol than this, but that they're really that that 10.5% is really just slamming you with, here. Uh, you can start to get almost a, a cough syrup uh, like taste. It's very thick. Uh, that cherry uh, taste is very strong. Um, also, quite a lot of alcohol taste here uh, and bitterness on top of that. This is <laughs> a well named Outer Darkness. Uh, you might actually wish you had been uh, blasted by that dragon's breath uh, rather than consume a whole bottle of this stuff <laughs> uh, definitely wouldn't suggest uh, uh, trying to quaff uh, one of these bottles by yourself <laughs> uh, very strong stuff uh, not the tastiest uh, selection but i guess if you're looking for something rather manly uh, to ease into the holiday season i guess you can try this i'm gonna go with a two out of five drinking horns on this uh, not not bad, interesting, uh, but probably not something you'd want to uh, rush out and experience for yourself. Unless you just really want something really, really strong. <laughs> okay, what about that quotation of the week? Uh, I was uh, looking for quotations about invent inventors, uh, since this is the anniversary of the invention of the transistor, a little device. It's very important to all of us. Uh, so I found a good quotation from Thomas Edison, and it goes something like this. Most men who develop an idea get it up to a point where it looks impossible, and then they get discouraged. But that is not the place to get discouraged. See you guys next week. Oh, John, I envy you so much. Your mind is so placid, straightforward, barely used.